I, I'm in a series of messages on the attributes of God, relating them to our everyday life. And today, I must discuss with you the wrath of God. I had a little, well more than a little, it was actually a rebuke. As I prepared the message this week, one of the tools that I used and have used for several messages in this series is Arthur Pink's book, The Attributes of God. And in the chapter on the wrath of God in Arthur Pink's book, at the end of it, he has two paragraphs, a note to pastors. And here's what it says. Brothers, we do in, excuse me, do we in our pulpit ministry preach on this solemn subject as much as we ought? The Old Testament prophets frequently told their hearers that their wicked lives provoked the Holy One of Israel and that they were storing up to themselves wrath against the day of wrath. And conditions in the world are no better now than they were then. John the Baptist warned his hearers to flee from the wrath to come. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Faithfulness demands that we speak as plainly about hell as we do about heaven. Thank you, author Pink. Needed that rebuke. So take your Bible this morning or your copy of God's Word and find Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Let's pray. Pray for me. Not an easy message, obviously, to stand and deliver. I need to be faithful to the whole counsel of God and and, and therefore will preach today on this subject. So pray for me. And then pray for yourself that, that you would hear the truth of God today and that the applications the Father needs to make to your life you would hear them as well. You would hear His voice speak to you. So let's pray for one another. Heavenly Father, thank You for inhabiting the room this morning, for showing up. Speak through me now Your truth. I I I want to be faithful to the text that I read and to you, Father. I pray for each one who hears today. I, I, I pray, Father, for every person that they would see who you are and, Father, where they stand before you today. And so, Father, your will be done in every life. That, that is my prayer. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Wrath and hell. Not exactly dinner time conversation topics. In fact, unpleasant subjects. Do you ever think of the wrath of God as something for which you need to apologize? Conversations with friends and neighbors... Maybe the subject gets broached. I feel like you need maybe to back away from the truth of 
the wrath of God, the reality of hell. Or, or maybe you just consider it a blemish on God's character. Or, or maybe you hold the idea that God's wrath is inconsistent with His other attributes like grace and mercy and love and therefore let's focus on those that we like and can understand rather than on this topic that seems to be inconsistent with the God we like to talk about. So, so let me start by defining the wrath of God. This is sort of a combination of several definitions of wrath that, I, that I've read. So this is really Pepper's definition of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is His eternal abhorrence of all unrighteousness. It is God's righteous disposition towards sin. His indignation against evil. To go back to Arthur Pink, Arthur Pink says the wrath of God is the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. I can understand that, I think. The holiness of God stirred up to react against sin. Another theologian says it is the just sentence which God passes upon evil doers the just sentence which god passes upon all evil doers would it surprise you to know that there are more references in scripture to the anger and wrath of god than there are to the love and mercy of god indeed there are the wrath of god is Simply a part of divine perfection. Just as much as holiness and sovereignty and faithfulness, those topics and attributes of God we've already looked at, just as much as grace and mercy and love, those attributes that await us in the weeks ahead, the, the wrath of God is a part of divine perfection. God's character would have a flaw in it if His wrath were absent. How could he be infinitely holy and yet disregard sin, overlook sin, refuse to deal with sin? How could he who delights in what is pure and lovely not hate and detest what is impure and vile? So the very nature of God makes hell a necessity as much as heaven is a reality. So look at our text again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Here's my life point this morning. God's wrath is revealed because His justice is sure. Our text tells us that the wrath of God is, is revealed in its present tense. It's not say the wrath of God is going to be revealed one day. It doesn't say the wrath of God has been revealed. No, the wrath of God is being revealed because His justice is sure. Now here's what I mean by that. I mean that wrath is the active and visible side of God's justice. Wrath is the active visible of the justice of, of God. Now just think with me for a moment. God's justice and wrath are first seen in the Garden of Eden. The sentence of death is announced. The earth is cursed. And Adam and Eve are driven out of paradise. His wrath is revealed there in Genesis chapter 3 because His justice is sure. And we don't have to go very far from that account to God judging Cain for Abel's murder. Then we continue on and we see that God judged the world for the epidemic of sin. And God in His wrath sent a flood. 
Then we take you to Genesis chapter 18, and I want to quote it right, so I've marked it in my Bible. In Genesis chapter 18, you see that God is about to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. He's about to pour out his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and Abraham gets into this bargaining with God. If you remember the story, for 50 people, if there's 50 righteous people down there, God, would you, would you destroy the cities? And, and God says, well, no, if there's 50, I'll not do it. And then Abraham starts, well, what if there's 45? I mean, would, what, if they, you know, they, what, what if they're just missing five? All they need to make 50. What if there's 45? Will you destroy them? And God says, no, if there's 45, I won't destroy it. And then, says, and then Abraham says, well, God, what if there's 40? And then what if there's 30? And, and what if there's 20? And, and, and what if there's just 10, right? And so Abraham's going to bargain. With, and in the midst of that conversation that Abraham has with God concerning whether or not he should pour out his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham makes this amazing statement. Abraham says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? In other words, what Abraham tells God, what Abraham reveals to us about God, is that whatever God does with Sodom and Gomorrah, it will be just. It will be right. Shall not the judge of the universe, shall not the the God of the universe deal justly? And Abraham is, is exactly right. Now you know the story. In his wrath, God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah because he does right. He acts with justice. He deals justly. And and then you move into Exodus, and in his wrath, God sends plagues upon the Egyptians who are enslaving his people. He sends that series of plagues designed to get the Egyptians' attention and to recognize him as Jehovah God. And God then leads through Moses. God leads his people out of Egypt and into the wilderness. God has sent his wrath upon the Egyptians. He does right and he has acted with justice. Then in the wilderness, in his wrath, God sends poisonous snakes. Upon his own people who are rebelling against him. And in his wrath, again, he acts with justice. He does what is right. And and, and I could go on and on through the Old Testament with example after example of the wrath of God being revealed because his justice is sure. One that just comes to mind is that God in his wrath destroyed the prophets of Baal in Elijah's day because he does right and he acts with justice. Now, please make this distinction. Notice I haven't said something and it's been intentional. God acted that way Because justice demanded it. I have not said that. Because that is wrong. Justice required God to do this. What's wrong with that statement? God acted that way because justice demands it be done. What's wrong with that Statement, it makes justice outside of God a standard to which God must conform. Ha! There is no standard of justice to which God must conform. Justice does not compel God to act in a certain way. No, 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 no. Nothing, no one ever required God to act in a certain way. Justice is not a standard that God follows. He is the standard. And so justice is His nature. 
That's what Genesis 18.25 says. That's what Abraham stated and revealed to us about God. That, in, that the God of the universe will act justly. He will deal with just, justice flows from the character of God. It's who He is. God is not and never will be accountable to some outside standard of justice. So whatever God does is right. Whatever God does is just. People get what they deserve. And everyone in here this morning says, "Yay, God. Sick 'em God. Give 'em hell." Pour out your wrath on all those evildoers. And we say that until we start to talk about your dad. And your mother. And your children. And you. Who are all evildoers in the eyes of the Lord. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man to die once, and after this comes judgment. And in that judgment, God will deal justly, do right with you. You will get what you deserve. And not one of us here this morning wants that because we all deserve hell what we deserve is hell why pastor because you've sinned because I have sinned because we've broken God's laws because we've rejected God's standards Because we've turned our backs on God and lived our own lives as the master of our fate and the captain of our souls. And the wages of sin is death. We'll get what we earned. We'll earn those wages. We'll get our pay. Death. Eternal separation from God. You see, death does not just simply mean cease to be. That's the way we often look at death. A person dies, they have ceased to be. A person dies, they have ceased to live on this earth. And yes, death does mean cease to be. But death also, in a far deeper meaning, death means separated from when a person dies on this earth we are separated from them but on a far deeper level the wages of sin is death and that means separated from God in hell Hell is the clearest evidence that God created you with a free will. You reject God. God honors that rejection. And in His justice, He provides a place for you to go. It's called hell. C.S. Lewis said there are only two basic views of life. Those who say, my will be done. And those who say, Thy will be done. That's the only two views of life. People either live with the first one or they live with the second one. My will be done. Thy will be done. And God in His wrath and justice says, I'll create a place so anyone who wishes to stay away from me can do so. God's wrath is revealed because His justice is sure. 
So dear family, what's our hope? What hope do we have? If we're going to stand before God in judgment and, and get what we deserve. And what we deserve is, is hell because, because we have sinned. We have broken God's laws. We've rejected His standards. We've, we've turned our backs and we've lived our own way. What is our hope? It's found in Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. And if you've got your Bible, I only have to turn one page, but... Turn to Romans chapter 3 verse 21 and I, and I want to show this to you. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe for there's no distinction. And, and the idea there is there's no distinction between how a Jew is saved and how a Gentile is saved. How an how a evildoer, a, a vile man is saved and how a moral man is saved. The righteousness that he desires and the righteousness that he needs comes through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no distinction among people. For all, the Jew, the Gentile... The vile sinner, the moral man, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now focus in on verse 25 because this is where we're going to spend our time. Verse 25 and 26. Whom God displayed publicly. This is Christ Jesus. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time. And here's our key phrase and I put it on the screen for you. So that He would be just and the justifier. Of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now dear family there's our hope. Our hope is through Jesus Christ. Now listen to me and learn. When God's wrath against sin. Sentences a person to die. Separated from him for eternity. Every one of us here under that sentence of death. When God's wrath against sin sentences a person to die, that does not contradict His grace or His mercy. It's not that God's wrath, God's justice wants to condemn the sinner and His grace and His mercy wants to pardon the sinner. So God's going to argue with himself and the one that wins is the one that determines your fate. And so it's like God's got justice and wrath on one shoulder. He's got mercy and grace on the other shoulder and they're speaking into his ear. Condemn him, condemn him, condemn him. And this one speaks into his ear. Pardon him, pardon him, pardon him. And so God is in this great argument with himself. No, not at all. Remember I told you in an earlier message that all of God's attributes are exercised in everything He does. In fact, A.W. Tozer put it this way. All of God, that's all His attributes. Holiness, sovereignty, faithfulness, mercy, love, grace, wrath, all, all, judgment, justice. All of God does all that God does. All of God does all that God does. He does not divide himself up into the different categories and attributes in order to perform a work. All of God does everything that he does. So grab hold of this. Notice that phrase. So that he would be just. God doesn't overlook your sin. Can't do it. God doesn't ignore your sin. No, He can't. 
God doesn't treat lightly your sin or my sin. No. God's not up there in heaven with a smile on his face and says, You know, old Pepper, he's, he's such a good guy. I mean, he tries hard. He, he means well. He, he's always willing to help out his neighbor. He's got a kind heart. Old Pepper, he, he's, a, he's a pretty good old guy. I tell you what, I, I, let's let him in, all right? Let's, let, let's, let, let's pardon old Pepper. Let's, let's let him in. No. No. God pours out his wrath on my sin. Because he's just. Can't overlook it, can't ignore it. God pours out his wrath on your sin. Who gets it though? Jesus. Jesus. So you look at that word in verse 25 that you can't pronounce, propitiation. I mean, it's, 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 it's a difficult word to pronounce. Listen, I went to seminary for three years to understand what it means, okay? Okay. Let me, let, let me share it with you. It is a beautiful word. In fact, it's the same word that is used in the Old Testament for the top of the mercy seat where the blood of the animal was sprinkled after it had been sacrificed for the sins of the people. The top of the mercy seat became a propitiation. Do you know what it means? It means the place that absorbs the wrath of God. The place that satisfies the wrath of God. Jesus becomes your propitiation. In that he becomes that place that absorbs the just and deserved wrath of God upon your sin. He absorbs it. He, he satisfies God's just nature to punish sin. Do you understand that's what happened at the cross? My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? At that moment, God, who is holy and pure, placed all the sin of humankind on his son Jesus and turned away. His just wrath was poured out on his son. His righteous wrath, his, his, his deserved wrath, because God does right, God acts with justice. And with wrath, He judges your sin and my sin. Because He is just. <laughs> now here's where it gets really good. <laughs> what God's wrath and justice demanded, God's grace and mercy provided. What is Absolutely. What his wrath demanded, his grace provided. Jesus died as your substitute. Jesus died. The, your well-deserved penalty of death was paid by Jesus. So God the Father is now not only just, but he is the justifier. Of the one who has faith in Jesus. He declares you righteous. Jesus gets your sin. You get the righteousness of Jesus. In fact, that's what 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. In Christ. And to receive this gift... You place your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. 
Alistair Begg in a book called Truth for Life writes on this subject and he, he says it so much better than I can and so I'm, I'm going to quote him and it's, 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 it's kind of lengthy but hang, hang, hang with me. He, he is, has, Alistair Begg has such a way with words. Listen to what he says. Without Christ's death on the cross, there is no gospel. It is through Jesus' sacrifice that God the Father made it possible for sinful men and women to have fellowship with Him. If we want to know God, we must meet Him in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through the cross does God show both justice in punishing sin and mercy in pardoning sin. Paving the way for people like you and me to enter heaven without spoiling its holiness. The cross is God's answer to answer both to sin itself and to his wrath against sin. To those who don't believe that, God's answer sounds absolutely foolish. But to those of us who do believe and understand the cross, it is the very power of God. If God were simply to overlook sin or stop being angry at it, then he would cease to be God. For God's justice is inherent in his character, and justice demands that sin is punished. He cannot turn a blind eye to evil. The cross of Christ is the way that God can be just and declare innocent sinners who have placed their faith in this crucified Savior. In order to deal with sin, God in His grace sent His own Son to take the punishment that sinners deserve and our salvation is by way of substitution. This substitution is why all the Old Testament sacrifices point to Jesus. In Christ's death, God's wrath, which is His righteous disposition towards sin, is satisfied and His love for you and me is magnified. That's it, dear people. That is it. Jesus came to bear the sin of all the world. And that's your sin. And that that is my sin. And when Christ took our place, He took on Himself the judgment that we deserve and are due to face On the last day, He took that to the cross so that we might stand before God's throne and say, I'm with Him. He lived the life that I could not live. And I'm placing my faith in your Son, Jesus. He died in my place. Now listen to me. Sir. Ma'am. If you're clinging today to some vague idea. That God is a good God. And he's never going to punish sin. Much less send you to hell. And that's the feeling of millions of Americans. And hundreds in Franklin County. That belief quiets their fears, allows them to go on living their lives as if nothing's going to happen to them. They live their lives as they see fit, practicing all kinds of pleasant sins. Because after all, God is a good God. He would never punish sin, much less send anyone to hell. How could a good God send anyone to hell? The people in hell know the answer to that question. A good God doesn't send anybody to hell. A good God sent His Son So that no one would have to go to hell. Anyone who goes to hell. Has said God. I do not want your will. Or your son. In my life. And God honors. 
that desire. Those in hell have chosen to be there. Embrace Jesus this morning. Would you place your faith in Jesus Christ today? It's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. You don't want what you deserve. You want to meet the God who is just. And the justifier. Of those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Those who believe in Him. Do not come into judgment. But have passed. Out of death. And into life. Would you embrace. By faith. Jesus today now listen to me brothers and sisters this message ought to break our hearts people need the Lord every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes empty people filled with care headed who knows where People need the Lord. We are called to take His light to a world where wrong seems right. What would be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through His love our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life that only we can share. People need the Lord. Let me pray. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters and myself today. Break our hearts, Father, over the lost around us, over those who who need to hear the message of salvation, the gift of God that can be theirs through faith in Jesus, and lay on our hearts a burden, Father, for lost people. Father, I pray for that one today, that those two today, that three, four, five, here today, Father, who are lost, apart from faith, headed for a judgment where they will get what they deserve. Snatch them, Father. Send your spirit of conviction. Bring them to faith today. In these next moments. In Jesus name I ask it. Amen. I want to thank you for watching today. I'm so glad you tuned in, logged on to our streaming service here at First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Texas. If you have made a decision to become a Christ follower, if you've made a decision to trust Christ, I would love to hear about that decision. Would you email me? My email address is simple. It's pepper at fbcmv.com. That's pepper at fbcmv.com. Or if you have questions about what it means to be a Christ follower, to be a Christian, please email me and I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Also, 
If you have prayer requests, if you want me to pray with you about something, email me as well. I'll be glad to take your prayer request and we can pray about it together. And again, thank you for watching today. If you do not have a church home, I hope you consider First Baptist Church, Mount Vernon, Texas, your church home. God's best on you today.